Good evening. I'm Peter Liotta, Executive Director of the Pell Center. Uh, I have to say, at the end of every semester, I'm, I'm more than a little nostalgic and sad that the Pell Center events are coming to a close. Now, I, I do realize from a student perspective, it's quite different. I'm probably thinking, just let get this thing over with. Uh, but yes, the semester is actually going to end. But it's particularly nostalgic for me because tonight concludes what has been a, I think, a very successful two-year program with the courage to speak voices of women who are changing the world. And tonight um, we have someone who will definitely take us out on the hot note. Um, my wife and I just took a few days of vacation time and you know, I was brought up for a lecture in, in Rome. Monday evening we are in what is my favorite museum in the world, our favorite museum in the world, which is the Gallery of Borghese. And standing in the presence of Bernini, who is without question the greatest sculptor gift that Italy ever gave to the world, yes, even greater than Michelangelo. Standing in astonishment at two statues, one is the rape of Prosperina, and the other is Apollo and Daphne. It is almost astounding to think what human genius is capable of. And I think that's what we're considering this evening. Uh, human genius, not only a, a great American treasure, Anthony Quinn, but the genius that I think can be in all of us. A minor anecdote, I don't think I've ever told anyone this, but 26 years ago as a young aircraft commander, I wrote an annual performance report for one of my crew members. And in it, I uh, I remarked on this personal duende and uh, caused a firestorm. My squadron commander said there's no such word. I said, no, but there really is. It's a really important word. And then went up to the wing commander, who was equivalent to the general officer. Said, there's no such word. Well, there is such a word. Uh, it's almost untranslatable, but you know when you're in the presence of it. A couple of quotes to the if you will. One is this wonderful Frank Lloyd Wright. Frank Lloyd Wright quote that um, I create to a man's size, not to his dimensions. And I think uh, we will soon find out that's the kind of enormous spirit of generosity and genius that Anthony Quinn possessed and why Catherine Quinn is promoting that legacy with the Anthony Quinn Foundation. Even I'm thinking of a remarkable quote of his, if I were left alone in the island, I would reconstruct the walls. I would want to say that I was here. Even quoting one of his favorite poems when he was younger, which is Alfred Ford Tennyson's Ulysses, which actually takes this example of Ulysses from Canto 26 of Dante's Inferno, like Ulysses not being satisfied with being home in Ithaca, but going out to find the world. This notion of the final lines of the poem are to strive to seek to find and not to yield. Since I started with the Italian genius, I'll end with the Italian genius of Robert Browning's poem, Andrea del Sarto. This notion of capacity. The line from Andrea del Sarto is a man's, ah, but a man's reach should exceed his grasp, else what's in heaven for? Keep that in mind as we consider the Duende of Anthony Quinn. And with that said, uh, I'm honored to introduce Catherine Quinn. I'm humbled to be in her presence, and I'm proud to call her my friend.
Can you hear me okay now? Yes. Sorry, I'm not used to doing this. I'm a little bit nervous. Um, thank you, Peter, for that wonderful introduction, and, and I think you set the, the tone of what I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm really humbled to be here at a place where so many dignitaries and world leaders have spoken before me. It's, um, it's really an honor when Peter asked me to speak. I, I couldn't believe it, and, um, and, I, and I took it very seriously and with great pride to be included in amongst people who are changing the world um, in my small way. Uh, I guess I have a, a message to, to relay um, that my husband, that my husband uh, about his life. And, and I thank all of you for coming here to listen, especially Mrs. Pell. Um, I'm surprised to see you here and happy to see you here. And, um, it's, it's an honor to be in a place uh, that's named after a man who also had a profound impact on so many people's lives. Um, so I consider myself lucky also to have been able to spend 16 years of my life with my late husband, Anthony Glenn. Not because of his celebrity, because honestly, when I first met him in 1985, I had no idea who he was. But because I learned from him a totally different way of looking at the world, he showed me the world through the eyes of an artist, a deep, passionate, volatile, creative, caring, and endlessly curious human being. When I met him, he was already 70 years old. But even at 70, he was more curious and full of life than anyone I had ever encountered. He talked about the projects he was working on and planning for the next few years that in my mind would have taken anyone decades to accomplish. He was writing several books, movie scripts, painting paintings, and carving sculptures for a coming art exhibit, and rehearsing for a stage play that was to tour around the country. All these things simultaneously, all in the next few years. And he said to me, I have so many things to get done and my life is such a mess. I need someone to help me organize my life. Can you do that? Uh, he didn't give me much time to ponder the question. He just put me right to work. He said, first we're going to pack books. There were endless shelves of books. And he was moving into a new apartment and setting up a studio for painting. Well, I didn't mind the work. I had come from a very strict Italian family with five children. My father managed a country club, and we were used to being called on at a moment's notice. What surprised me, though, was that he was packing books with me. He stood right next to me, handing me books to put away. These books were his treasures. They were too important for the movers to handle. And every so often, when he got tired of working, he'd pull a book off the shelf. He'd leave through it briefly and ask me, have you ever read T.S. Eliot? Let me read you this poem, it's wonderful. And he'd read me the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, then Shakespeare's sonnets, then Walt Whitman's Two Strangers from Alabama. And when we got to the art section, his books were like a, it was like a, a public library. Uh, have you ever heard of Joie Miro? Look at these beautiful paintings. And he would do that over and over again and share stories with me about the artists, about the writers, the poets, but not in a teacherly sort of way. He would talk to, them, talk to me about them as if they were friends of his, as if he had just had dinner with them the night before. The stories would lead to conversation about his life, about philosophy, about the world. He was an infinitely curious and interesting man and made me feel like the most interesting and important person in the world. He was curious, as curious about my life as I was about his. What I didn't realize then, that he told me years later, was just how important I was to him at the time in his life and how my way of being the calm center to the storm of creativity that was going on around him helping him juggle lawyers, producers, accountants, and writers and family, enabled him to bring a lot of those projects to fruition. In order to have a deeper understanding about who a person is and is as an adult, it helps to know something about their youth. I don't know how many of you know his story already, but I'd like to share with you Anthony Quinn, the young boy. I'm going to refer to him as Tony tonight, because that's what his closest Tony was born in Chihuahua, Mexico in 1915, in the middle of the Mexican Revolution. His father, then just 18 years old, was fighting on the battlefield. His mother, believe it or not, uh, was fighting on the same battlefield. Um, in Mexico, women were allowed to go to war, not to fight, but to support their, their husbands.
was to cook for them, to take care of them. She was forced to leave when she was uh, when they found out she was pregnant. The women fighters were called soldaderas in Mexico. The war had been going on for five years, and by the late 1915, the economic situation was so bad in Mexico that people were leaving by the thousands to find work to be able to feed their families. Tony's mother decided to leave with her infant son and look for work in Texas. That trip was over 200 miles. She packed eight-month-old Tony in a sack on her back talked the train operator into letting her sit in the coal car, since she didn't have any money for the trip. She hid the baby under the coals for most of the trip so he wouldn't be discovered. That grueling trip must have been burned in his memory, because many years later, as an adult, he described the train station to his mother in great detail. In all his life, he had a fear of suffocating that he attributed to that experience. He and his mother lived as refugees in a camp by the Rio Grande in El Paso. Tony remembered those years well, and with happiness. His mother would bring him along and create jobs for him to help her out. He picked up little twigs off the ground, and she bundled them together and sold them for kindling. His father would find them years later and join them on and off over the next few years as the Civil War continued in Mexico. After the birth of Tony's sister in 1918, their father remained with them, and they traveled together as migrant workers, eventually settling in East Los Angeles in a neighborhood of Mexican in the early 1920s, Tony's father, Francisco Quinn, got a job at Celix Studio in Los Angeles. The Celix was both a studio and a zoo, and the animals that were kept there were mainly for use in the films. He trained as a cameraman and helped care for the large animals. Sometimes he took Tony to work with him to see the animals and to watch the movies being filmed. Tony treasured those times and sat quietly in the corner and sketched faces as he watched the actors work. Even then, as a seven-year-old boy, people always took a liking to him. Douglas Fairbanks once gave Tony $25 for a sketch he had done. That was more than his father got paid for a week's work. In 1926, when Tony was just 11 years old, his father was struck by a car on the road in front of their house and was killed instantly. Up to that point, Tony had always worked, but only to do his part for the family. All of a sudden, he became the man of the house, and he felt responsible for his mother, grandmother, and sister. They couldn't even afford a headstone for the grave. So Tony asked his friend's father, who worked as a stone carver, for a scrap piece of granite, and he learned to chisel the letters in stone. As he got older, he would skip school a lot to go to work. One way he found that he could earn money was by entering contests. Dance contests, sculpture contests, and drawing contests, anything that he could find. At around the age 13, he won a $100 prize for a plaster bust of Abraham Lincoln. That was a fortune for him. One such contest changed his life dramatically. The sketch of a food display at a Ralph's Market, which is a popular West Coast supermarket, won him a private meeting with Frank Lloyd Wright. Wright's flamboyant character was like none that he had ever met. He was in the prime of his life and had already designed some of his most famous homes. He was passionate about his work and dedicated to its intent. Wright didn't just design homes, he designed lifestyles for people, as Peter explained. And he, so it was fitting when he asked Tony, what's wrong with your speech, young man? You can't be an architect if you can't speak properly. You have to be able to convince people how they should live. And Tony replied simply, I don't know, sir. I didn't know there was anything wrong with my speech. So Wright sent him to a doctor who performed minor surgery on his tongue. The rehab after surgery included months of speech therapy. Tony couldn't afford. He arranged with an acting teacher, Catherine Hamill, that he would be the janitor at the school in exchange for speech lessons. He practiced, studied, and read books, and watched the theater students rehearse for their production, as he did his janitor work. And as opening night for the play got closer, one of the students had terrible stage fright. To Tony's surprise, Miss Hamill asked him to fill in for the student. That was March 7, 1933, and the play was Noel Coward's Hay Fever. He gave a convincing performance as a privileged young English boy named Simon Bliss. But more importantly, the experience set him on a path. Until then, he had wanted to be an architect. Now his world was opening up to new things, literature, art, music, and theater. He couldn't afford to stop working to finish high school, so he continued to pick up odd jobs while satisfying his artistic hunger and curiosity. He drove a taxi, he worked in a car showroom, and as the foreman of a mattress factory. For a few years, 
years, he was even an amateur boxer until his trainer convinced him to quit, telling him he just didn't have the killer instinct needed to be a great boxer. He wandered the countryside, hopping freight trains, looking for work from town to town. Regardless of the work he did, he remembered a lesson his father taught him. No matter what job you do, do it with pride and do it well. Tony took this advice to heart, and he took pride in being the best at whatever he was doing at the moment. In his wanderings, he accumulated books and read voraciously. Thomas Wolfe, William Zeroyan, Langston Hughes, John Steinbeck, Ernest Hemingway, whatever he could get his hands on. Now this was California in the 1930s. The Great Depression was on, the Dust Bowl in the Midwest, and employment was out of control. The Mexicans, whether they were legally in the country or not, were discriminated against and blamed for many of California's problems. Tony knew that he had another calling in life. He had big dreams, and he was an idealist who had a deep hunger in his soul. In his heart, he knew that he was different. He carried himself with pride and dignity and worked hard to educate himself about everything. Accomplished people he encountered throughout his young life recognized this quality in him and took him under their wing. Took, took him under their wing. One thing led to another, and he never wasted a chance to improve his life and work tirelessly to get himself to the next level. One night after performing the lead in a play about John Barrymore called Clean Beds, Tony was surprised to opening, open the dressing room door and see the real John Barrymore standing there. Barrymore, the grandfather of Drew Barrymore, for the younger generation, was one of Hollywood's biggest actors at the time. Barrymore was just as surprised to find a 21-year-old kid playing him. The makeup they put on him made him look 60. He took a liking to Tony and invited him into his life and his circle of friends. Barrymore's friends were actors, artists, writers, musicians, and intellectuals. They all accepted Tony as their little surrogate son and protege, and sometimes their designated driver when they had too much to drink. The relationship with Barrymore lasted only six years until his death at age 60. But that period had a profound impact on Tony. Barrymore was the father figure he needed since the loss of his own father. These were tumultuous times, though, for Tony. The year before, he had lost his only son, Christopher, at the age of two, in a drowning incident. He was just starting to build a family in his life as an actor. And the pain of his loss was very difficult for him to cope with. So he immersed himself in his work. For years, he would not acknowledge losing his son, and he kept himself too busy to deal with it emotionally. He created paintings and drawings and wrote and acted, anything to try to distract himself from the deep hurt he was feeling inside. Now there's a Spanish word to describe that kind of force of creativity that Peter already introduced to us. Creativity that is not only born out of talent, but out of pain and suffering, out of life's cruel experiences that hurt us so deeply that the only way we know how to deal with them is through creative expression. The word is duende. Duende means a lot of things to a lot of different people. I searched for a definition, but instead I found essays and long explanations. Here's a sample. In music, all that has dark sounds has duende. The dark sounds from which we get what is real in art. Thus, duende is a power and not a behavior. A struggle and not a concept. It surges up from the soles of the feet, which means it is not a matter of ability, but of real life form, blood, of ancient culture, of creative action. The second definition was inspiration, magic, Garcia Lorca wrote an 11 page essay on Duende. He said, It comes to an artist who dares to explore the darker regions of the heart. A Time Magazine article about Lorca from 1998 calls it the most elusive word in the, in the Spanish language and says, Duende is almost a blood type. Someone who has it in their veins is likely to be creative, prescient, spontaneous, captivating, melancholic, and volatile. It is a bewitching faculty. And by all those definitions, I'd say yes, Tony had Duende. He once wrote the preface to a book about great explorers. This is part of what he wrote. Most of us live our lives trying to play it safe, taking few risks. As children, we are used to a constant, constant challenges from other children. The games of I dare you that force us to find courage to expand our world. As we get older, fewer and fewer know how to turn the game into a way of life. This knowledge is the key to daring on the highest level, an artistic level. 
that was Anthony Quinn, the actor who was willing to take risks, the artist always battling with the fear of putting that first brush stroke on a blank white canvas, the writer opening up his vulnerability for all the world to read, the father helping his many children through the labyrinth of life so they wouldn't have to struggle as he did, the husband sharing his joys and his sorrows, and the friend eager to exchange ideas and ideals and to help at times of need, always passionate in his search for the truth, always in search of authenticity, something that stirred his soul. You could feel his intensity when you met him. He studied everyone he met. Tony was just as interested in the homeless man playing chess in the park as he was in the Queen of England. He studied your eyes, your facial expressions, and he listened for the truth in your, in your words. He took notes constantly, mental notes, written notes. He sketched drawings and ideas for sculpture he wanted to create. Living with that kind of intensity is not easy. Many of you may have experienced life with a creative person. The highs are very high, but the lows can also be very low. I experience those ups and downs on a daily basis, sometimes about small things like not being able to find the right paint color or misplacing a favorite sweater. Other times, not so small things. A telephone conversation with one of his 13 children could easily put him in a happy mood, but one wrong turn of the conversation could just as easily put him in an emotional abyss for hours. Once, shortly after his divorce, he was waiting for a huge shipment of artwork to come from his home in Italy. There was one piece out of hundreds that meant the world to him. It was the Tang Dynasty horse, the first piece of artwork that he had ever collected. The lawyers wouldn't let him take the piece with him when he was in Italy. They made him ship it in a container across the Atlantic with all the rest of the books and artwork. He stressed about it for a month. Of course, when it arrived in Rhode Island, the horse was broken in three pieces because it had been packed carelessly, intentionally. That put him in a depression for a few weeks. He didn't understand spite or mean spiritedness. The reason that piece was so important to him was because when he was studying at that acting school, he used to pass in front of an antique shop every day to go on his way home from acting and, and struggling and working. And he had very little money. He used to stop in front of the shop and look in the window and admire this horse. And he did it every day. And a few weeks after uh, he started looking at it, the owner came out and he said, you really like that horse, don't you, kid? And he said, I love it. And he said, well, why don't you buy it? He said, I could never afford to buy something like that. He said, well, you look like you're going to be somebody someday, so I'll tell you what. I'll let you pay for it a little bit at a time. So when you have some money, you come in and give me money, $750. And, he, and it was the first person who really believed in him, and he believed that he would be success. And he let him take the horse for it when he had his first acting job in the movies. And so that piece always stayed with him. And for him to have somebody destroy it intentionally, he didn't understand that kind of, that kind of weakness. An example at the other end of the emotional spectrum is the time we spent our first Christmas together with our, our daughter, Antonia, away from home. We were in London, living in a hotel for a few weeks while he was working on an upcoming project. One day when he was out in meetings, I went and bought a Christmas tree and handmade English ornaments and bows and went back to the hotel and decorated the tree with Antonia. When he returned that evening, the sight of the tree brought tears to his eyes, and he said it was the most beautiful and thoughtful gift anyone had ever given him. He treasured those ornaments and put them on our tree every year after. Something so simple could make him so happy. Tony's duende also drove him to collect hundreds of pieces of artwork from all over the world, rocks and stones fragments off the beach, and tree stumps and twisted gnarly pieces of wood, anything with a form or color that inspired him. He studied them, carved them, painted them. Sometimes, as he did with a piece of old pottery I found for him on the beach, he would just admire it and mount it on a stand and display it on a shelf with all of his other treasures. He read thousands of books, books about people, about history, about religion, about poetry, psychology, underlining passages and making notes in the margins. He studied great men and women and their complex lives. When he acted, no matter how small the role, he had to know that character deep down inside, and as a result, they all became a part of him, and he a part of them. And when he left a movie or finished a painting,
painting or sculpture, there was an emptiness inside. Winning Academy Awards and Golden Globes and having art exhibitions around the world are all incredible achievements and very gratifying. But the celebrity and the accolades for the ego, but not the soul. The soul with Duende is constantly hungry and needs to be fed. In search of their next meaningful project, the person with Duende can be temperamental, insecure, and unreasonable. Picasso explained best when someone once asked him, Mr. Picasso, I would give anything to have half your talent. His reply was, but you wouldn't take one tenth of the nightmares that go with it. Those times are challenging in any relationship, especially in a marriage. I found if I changed my perspective and looked for the duende in myself, had a deeper understanding of where his emotions were coming from, that maybe I could find a creative way to bring back the balance. And usually it worked. When you search deeply enough, when you care sincerely about the other person, the answers find you. Our relationship worked because I simplified him and he complicated me. <laughs> we both needed each other, and we shared and learned and continued to grow together. He never wanted me to stop growing and learning, even after he was gone. Although he rarely talked about dying, he knew he would live forever. So time was precious to him. He loathed anyone or anything that wasted his time, especially if it took time away from family. Family was very important to Tony. Children gave him joy and laughter, pure and deep laughter. They brought out the magic in him because they gave him the courage to dare and to keep challenging himself. He would observe their courage
Even in Lorca's 11-page uh, essay, uh, he doesn't he doesn't talk about the um, etymology of the word. He, he just talks about the where it comes from, and more um, is described as a as a nagging presence in your soul that will let you cheat, that will just eat away at you until it brings you to to a point. Almost it, Lorca compares it to you to the point of near death because it's so dangerous to go into those dark regions of your emotions um, and how, and how uh, some of some artists who have it really suffer from it because in going there they bring out emotions that, that are, are very painful and maybe um, where you know we enjoy a performance or a book that the artist who creates that work suffers a lot in its creation um, so I don't know about the relationship with radio, but it's interesting. So, could you tell us a little bit about the foundation? Yes, the foundation, um, so I started it uh, eight years ago, but only recently have we begun to, to uh, raise money for scholarships to be able to, it, really the, the mission of the foundation is to promote the importance of the arts, as I spoke about, in education, in everyday life. And as time goes on, as the economy suffers, most of the schools cut the arts out of, out of their programs because they view them as extracurricular or unimportant. And so as part of the foundation and, and, and Tony's legacy, raise money to give scholarships to children to go to arts, schools, camps. Hopefully, eventually, we'll, we'll be able to bring it to the college level and even, even maybe the continuing education level because there are a lot of artists out there who never got to really explore um, those parts of themselves and they're stuck in careers that they, you know, that aren't really uh, developing their full potential. Um, so the scholarships, then, then we're hopefully we'll have a center where his books will be housed, where we'll, we'll run programs for, um, to have speakers come in and classes, and, and creating partnerships with other arts organizations around the country, around the world, that have the same, um, same goals as we do.
he, he spent months with him, not realizing that he was living with Zorba, and he was just a free spirit, and he had the same philosophy about life. And Tony ended up writing a book um, called Sam Zorba and Me about the experience of getting into that character. And, uh, and I think, um, knowing him, I'm not sure if he became Zorba or Zorba became him, but he was very much like that character. I was wondering if you might want to tell about that story. Um, yeah, it was wonderfully about how difficult it was to make a phone call or doodles. Oh, and when he, was, when he was in Greece, it was in the early 60s, and telephones, I think Greece is even difficult now, catching up with technology. Um, but even when he was there in the 60s, uh, making a long-distance te telephone call was a very difficult thing, and he would sit in his, in his apartment for hours, waiting on hold with the long-distance operator while she connected him with California or whichever, you know, state he was trying to get in touch with. And while he was on the phone on hold, he would sketch, doodle, and, and uh, all these sketches he accumulated in a, in a drawer. And one day he was at the flea market with his friend Sam, and Sam said, look, Tony, those drawings look just like yours. And they went over to the stand, and he said, those are mine. And now the housekeeper was taking the drawings and selling them at the flea market. Just 
the, the ability to see something in the material. Well, we were, I mean, he, he picked up small stones and big stones. Everywhere we traveled, he would pick things up off the beach and hand them to me and say, ship this home. Somehow I would have to figure out how to get it back to Rhode Island, no matter where we were. And we were in Italy, um, in Rome, and he was working with a writer on a story and driving through the hills of Rome. And the writer was car sick and had to get out and go to the, use the, the bathroom. So he pulled over on the side of the road. And while we sat there in the car waiting for him to come out, he was in front of the nursery. And he was admiring this so kind of a coral, a sea coral. It's very porous and, and, uh, and full of holes. And it was in front of the nursery, um, just kind of marking the entrance. And he said, let's go in there and find out what that stone is. Well, I want to take it home with me. I want to put it in my backyard and sculpt it. And so they said, okay, well, we'll call you, go back to your hotel, we'll call you, we'll, we'll you know, dig it out of the ground. And as he walked around the nursery property, he said, and while you're at it, just give me that one and that one and that one. And he <laughs> nine stones. There was tons of, of, of rocks. And so he said, okay, well, I'll have to charge you a thousand dollars. He said, that's okay. And so we went back to the hotel and got a phone call the next day saying, we can't, we can't send you that stone. We, we dug it and it's, it's dug in five feet into the ground. So when you pull it out, the thing is almost eight feet tall. And he said, that's okay, better. Better for me. Take it out. Ship it home. So it cost him $1,000 to buy it and $9,000 to ship it out. <laughs> but I used that stone as his headstone in his garden because he's buried in our, in our backyard and that's his nature did to a stone, the holes, the time, you could see the thousands of years that he spent in the ocean, and, and it seemed like a prehistoric stone. Other questions? We have a lot of terms right behind the microphone. I also want to thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Uh, you said you were nervous. It was a beautiful presentation. Thank you. You brought your late husband alive. You made a real, I just knew him as a celebrity. Now I know him as a very special person, so yes. thank you. Thank you very much. One back in the library again. Uh, Mike's coming over to you. In the movie La Strada, he played named Zampano, and uh, in Italian the word Zampa means paw, on Black Panther. Now, do you know anything about that name Zampano? In Italian it would be, if it were third per the third person plural of a conjugated verb, it would mean they paw. Uh, do you know anything about the, the name he was given? I think that must be just coincidence because that character was uh, Fellini's invention, and and uh, when he met Fellini, he was uh, he was all, he was making another movie in Italy, and he wanted to meet Fellini because he, he was such a, a phenomenon. And people were talking about his movies and his new style of making movies at the time, and he met Fellini, and, and uh, they, neither one of them. Tony didn't speak Italian, and Fellini didn't speak English at the time. And he, through a translator, he said, I want you to make my movie. I want you to be in my movie. And Tony said, well, where's the script? And he said, I'll get you the script tomorrow. And so they had this very primitive conversation. And the next day, he gave him a piece of paper and said, that's the script. And, and they had no script. That was his way of working. And as they worked out, it worked um, day by day. They found out what they were going to do. But they just knew the, the general story. And that's, that's how it worked. It was really fascinating. And, and for Tony, that was a real life-changing experience making that movie because it was the first time he had made a movie about people's feelings. It wasn't a big, these big American Cecil B. DeMille blockbuster movies that were, you know, dancing, singing, entertainment movies, but more internal. And, and that was a big challenge for him. And, and he has a scene on the beach where he's, he's lost everything and he's very sad. And, and crying and 
he brought that film back to the United States to show his father-in-law. His father-in-law was Cecil B. DeVille. And he had a screening at his house. And his father-in-law said, if you own any part of that movie, sell it. It's a piece of junk. And nobody will ever watch movies like that. And that movie is historically what changed the way films were made in, in, the, in the United States. I do want to mention, uh, and I encourage all of you, even if you necessarily decide not to, buy it, to take a look on uh, the books that are available at Anthony Quinn's on it. I mean, particularly students who can't afford it. Take a look. It is such a gorgeous book. Um, you really want to enjoy it. Sadly, this is last for event for the year, so we do want to wish you a blessed Thanksgiving and great holidays. citizens of the Belsheim, but just by your um, questions and enthusiasm throughout the year. But I say all that, let's take a moment to just enjoy this evening and consider how lucky we are to be in the presence of Jackie Quinn. I just want to introduce my children because I'm so proud that they come and support me and attend these. So, and Tony and Ryan, can you just come up here and, and uh, take a